Welcome. I'm Elizabeth Cousins, President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us today. 2020 is a year like few others. As we all face intersecting emergencies in the health of our persons, our societies, and our planet, 2020 must become the year that starts a decisive decade of climate action, and we know what we have to do. The concentrations of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere and the temperature of our planet simply won't stop rising until the world reaches net zero emissions. Since the Paris Agreement was adopted just five short years ago, we have made some progress, but overall we are failing to bend the emissions curve downward far enough, fast enough. To change that and to set ourselves on an irreversible net zero trajectory, we need both national ambition, and we saw a big announcement yesterday, and private sector ambition, and we need it now. That's why I am so honored to moderate this session on Making Net Zero Possible, which is part of the follow-up to the World Economic Forum's Net Zero Challenge. The Net Zero Challenge, launched in Davos in January, challenged WEF's 2,000 plus corporate members and partners from government and civil society to commit to net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier, and that's what we're here to discuss today. I'm so pleased that the executive chairman of the forum, Professor Klaus Schwab, is with us along with a powerful panel of climate leaders to talk about how to turn ambition into action in the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow go next year and beyond. Let me give a couple housekeeping notes before turning to Professor Schwab. To make this session as interactive as possible, we're going to periodically ask participants to express their views and definitely to pose questions to our panel. We'll be using the Slido platform. You can access that at um, by scanning the QR code that you see on your screen. That's the easiest way. You can also access it at slido.com or by and use the event code SDIS. We'll be collecting your input and questions throughout the session. Please participate and definitely get your questions in early so that we make best use of our time together. So to get that started, please go to Slido now and share your answer to the following question. In one word, what does climate ambition mean to you? Again, in one word, what does climate ambition mean to you? And we'll share the results in a word cloud shortly. Well, I'd now like to begin by asking Professor Schwab a question. Professor Schwab, at this year's annual meeting in Davos, together with the CEOs of Bank of America and Royal DSM, you issued the Net Zero Challenge. Mm -hmm. You invited all Davos participants to set a target to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier. Tell us about the progress so far, how we can maximize its impact ahead of COP26, and just what this challenge really means to all of us. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and uh, thanks to the leaders, uh, the CEOs, uh, the climate leaders, including uh, Jasper Brodin, uh, CEO of Inca Group, and um, Mark Schneider, CEO of Nestle, as well as the other panelists joining us for this so important sessions this evening. 2020 is a critical year for climate change action. The COVID pandemic has created a new context and a new reality, presenting us both with opportunities and risks. The opportunity for a great reset and rebuilding more resilient and climate smart societies but also the risk of a great lock-in of climate tipping points. This is really a decisive decade for the future of us, for the future of our children and grandchildren. We need to raise ambition and we need to translate the ambition into action. At the World Economic Forum, we call this the three A's, ambition, setting ambitious targets and commitments, action, implementing concrete and measurable net zero pathways, and alignment, working towards a climate aligned economy and society. We have mobilized two key alliances to step up ambition on climate. Our CEO Climate Leaders Alliance with 82 companies and the International Business Council with 122 companies. We feel a strong signal of commitment and ambition from those communities and the CEOs who lead those communities. 
despite so this, the negative or dire economic consequences brought by COVID, many companies such as those uh, represented by the alliance of CEO climate leaders are responding with ambitious commitments such as stepping up on disclosure of emissions, adopting targets for scope reductions and taking the net zero challenge pledge. These are definitely steps in the right direction. We must keep the momentum and translate ambition into action. For this, we need to understand what it means in concrete terms to take on and deliver a net zero commitment by focusing on the practicalities of implementation. That is why the forum launched the Mission Possible Platform together with the UN, the Energy Transitions Commission, and many other organizations and, and governments. This partnership focuses on decarbonization of the most energy intensive industries. When they got the message, we will remove 30% of global emissions. We need your help in this work. No single organization can tackle the challenge of climate change alone. The Forum is committed to developing the public and private collaborations that will be critical to stewardship of our global commons to drive cohesive, sustainable, resilient, economic and social systems. We need a great reset that will help us build the net zero economy that is the key for our sustainable future. This requires that we play our part in working with our partners to translate ambitions into action. I'm therefore looking forward to the discussion and I'm sure that this session will be again a major step towards a climate neutral future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Schwab. I think we all need to heed your call to play our part because as you say, this is bigger than all of us and thank you for your personal leadership on climate as well. Let's take a quick look at Slido and see how people have answered the question. I think we have a screen to share. I see some of mine up there. I imagine you all see all of yours. Hope, survival, and action. You really couldn't put it more squarely than that. Change, opportunity. We'll come back to some of these themes in our conversation. Thank you all for doing that. And do as we start our conversation with the panelists, remember to use Slido to start any questions or comments that you have so we can make sure to factor those into our discussion. Well, let's turn now to our panel. We'll have some starting discussion. As I say, we will have question and answer at the end. Um, you have our uh, eminent panelists bios already. So I'll just introduce them briefly as they each take the floor. And I wanna start with Jesper Broden. Uh, Jesper is the CEO of Inca Group, the holding company for IKEA. And his career with IKEA spans more than 20 years, uh, and you stepped into your current role in 2017. Jesper, we're delighted that you could join us. Yeah. IKEA has announced a commitment to become climate positive by 2030. Tell us what that means in concrete terms to Professor Schwab's point about practicalities for IKEA, and how, how will you get there? Thank you. It means uh, a lot of hard work, I can, I can tell you. Uh, but let me start by, by thanking you for the opportunity and also uh, to thank you, Professor Schwab, for your leadership to bring us together, um, to inspire us with this powerful, but also simple message uh, calling on us to take our responsibility. Um, to start with, uh, we recognize that this is most likely the most important decade in the history of humankind. And as such, uh, we need indeed to take uh, a leap of faith and make sure that we uh, step into the arena where we take our responsibility. But for us, there is also, and I think for everybody who steps into this, there is also a matter of practicalities about planning, about engineering solutions. Uh, we have uh, committed ourselves to the uh, Paris Agreement and to the 1.5 uh, Celsius degree target. And I think that is the starting point. It has to start with the commitment. But of course, 
nothing will change only by a commitment. So after that, we need to put our um, heads together to make a plan. We believe that the plan, as, as we are uh, leading it now, um, is uh, uh, of course important to be owned by us as a company and as a corporation, but it also needs scrutiny. So, uh, why we are advocates for the, for example, the science-based target initiatives and other ways of uh, providing us with uh, enough proof points that we are actually uh, onto the right targets and that we are moving in the right direction. To the, the question on why, uh, we can see three reasons and we believe that they are each one important enough for us. Uh, to start with, it is 2020 with the facts that we have at the table today. We think it's not um, basically okay for us to hand over to the next generation of leaders. We need to address the situation now. We need to put action in place that can deliver in the decade to come. Um, secondly, and this is incredibly important, people are expecting us to take actions and take leadership. We have uh, latest research showing basically a hockey stick in both worrying and concerns from people, from our consumers, our coworkers, but also um, that people are starting to see how they can play a role in this by their uh, choices as consumers. Third, which I think is talked too little about, is uh, this is not uh, and shouldn't be seen as a sacrifice. There are important and difficult decisions that need to be taken, timing of investments, etc. But this is the new business model of the world. Why we should never fall for the, um, for the um, uh, trap of seeing this uh, sustainability as something against our business, but see it the opposite way around and then help each other to, to overcome the myths uh, of, um, uh, of doing that. I am optimistic, we are optimistic. Yeah, we, we, uh, we see, uh, as you have referred to today, so many companies now stepping up the game. The China announcement was, I think, uh, a very important milestone in the whole climate work. And that's going to fuel, I think, not only other governments, but also us companies uh, to reach out and do more. Um, we also in IKEA, we, we are optimistic. We saw last year, uh, for the first time in our um, environment, that is possible. In our scope three, we were capable to grow with more than 6% and we reduced our absolute carbon by 4% or a little bit more than that. So it's absolutely possible to do good business and be a good business. And finally, maybe to say that I'm optimistic also being part of the uh, WEF Climate Alliance, the CEO Alliance. We have moved, I think, from agreeing on the issue to recently uh, step up the game to commit and to step into, I think, what Professor Schwab was referring to, to the actions. And I and we will place much more of our time and efforts in the future sharing, um, I think, uh, issues, challenges, but also the actions that are needed to address the situation. So thank you. Thank you very much. This point of yours about the next generation of leadership is so critical and that the world's expectations are on all of us. And I think also that individual choices matter. It's very easy to feel powerless in the face of something as, uh, as, as momentous as what we're facing. And um, yet there's a tremendous power in everyone's individual actions. Um, Mark Schneider, I want to go next to you. Mark Schneider is the CEO of Nestle, uh, previously the CEO of Fresenius, a global healthcare company. And Mark, Nestle has committed to net zero emission by 2050. Tell us about the process you went through to set that goal. And with COP26 just 15 months away, what progress do you think you'll be able to show by then? Thanks, Elizabeth. And let me just uh, start by saying I'm delighted to be on this uh, panel. And uh, I would also like to thank the United Nations and the WEF uh, for their leadership in this very, very important area. In terms of uh, the spirit and the objectives um, and, and the mindset as we think about climate change, let me just echo what uh, Jesper said. I think I couldn't say it better. I think this is also how we approach this uh, as a company that uh, is 154 years old. And we don't like to kick down problems to future generations. We like to take action now. In terms specifically of what we want to get accomplished uh, by the end of next year, a uh, few things. Uh, first, uh, let's go back to the United Nations pledge. We took that pledge last year. The United Nations asked that uh, there is a two-year window in which you then offer a specific time-bound plan. As you can imagine, on any 30-year commitment, if you don't offer a specific time-bound plan with specific milestones, uh, there's no credibility. Um, we said from the onset that we do not want to take the full two years. Uh, we'd rather be out next uh, by, the, by the end of this year with a specific plan because 
my experience in business is when you have two years, your plan doesn't get better in the second year. So you might as well lock it down now and then get going and align everyone inside the organization, outside of the organization and focus on action, which I think is the key word. So that's one key deliverable that we hope to uh, have out there by the end of this year. And uh, it's important there to have a nice set of ambition, specific metrics, uh, but also a certain sense of realism of some of the open questions that need to be solved over that 30 year uh, time span. Second thing specifically here for Nestle and for all companies that deal with agricultural products, um, the single biggest thing short term that we can do to help the climate situation is to stop deforestation in our supply chains. So before we embark on all sorts of new things, you know, let's stop that um, clearing hole we have that comes from deforestation. And uh, that's a hole below the waterline. So basically for all the new things that you do, you basically have backfill from this problem uh, uh, continuing. And uh, this is where no one has yet gone to 100% uh, to our knowledge. We expect to be at about 90% at the end of this year, but 90% is not good enough. I think there's going to be tremendous motivation energy coming from getting as close as possible to 100%. It's not easy because as you approach the last 10%, you're also getting into a lot of interesting trade-offs between avoiding deforestation on the one hand, but also assuring uh, rural li livelihoods in very poor areas of the world on the other hand. But we hope to make more specific progress in 2021 and then also hope to be able to lock in on a specific end date when we uh, expect to be at 100% somewhere in the early 20s uh, and have that in sight uh, by the time COP26 takes place. And then the third one, um, let me point you to a thought process that happened with us since we took the pledge. Uh, the pledge is super important and everyone has to clean up their operations and their supply chains. But over and above that, I think um, we're, we're running out of time. And if you want to really unleash some energy and motivation and uh, sort of uh, put the tiger on the tank, so to speak, it's important to also consider high quality offsets that are related to your operations. So those are key words, uh, high quality, because you wouldn't want to engage in some dodgy schemes and they should be related to your operation. So it should not be totally removed from what you're doing but it gives you so much more latitude to move something quickly in a short period of time. Because sometimes if you only focus on your own supply chain and your own operations, uh, you do run into time delays that are unavoidable. And so we have made some pledges. Uh, Nespresso through the use of high quality offsets expects to be carbon neutral by 2022. Some of our high quality, uh, high premium water brands such as uh, Perrier and San Pellegrino and Aquapana also expect to be uh, carbon neutral by 2022. And I think until the time that COP26 takes place, we expect to identify more brands where we can accomplish this uh, through a combination of what we do inside our operations, inside our supply chain, but then also through the use of high quality offsets. With that, back to you. Thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate your starting point about credibility and that that turns not just on having metrics and being serious about milestones and timeframes, but also about being candid about trade-offs and be having realistic conversations about what those are and really trying to struggle through them uh, together. Um, I now have the pleasure to turn to Lisa Jackson. Lisa, it's wonderful to see you. Lisa is Apple's Vice President of Environment Policy and Social Initiatives. Previously, she served as the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Administrator during President Obama's first term. Lisa, Apple has set an ambitious goal of being 100% carbon neutral in its supply chain and products by 2030. What is the biggest challenge you face in decarbonizing your supply chains and how are you going to measure progress? It's great to see you as well, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for having me to you and to Professor Schwab and WEF. Um, and greetings to my fellow panelists. Uh, challenges abound when we take on big ambitions as the leaders here have so aptly stated um, for me. Um, but I think they're the kind of challenges that uh, certainly Apple has a history of meeting. Um, you're right, this summer we announced that we would build on the work we've already done. So I think my answer is, is really We've done this work before. We understand our supply chain. The first challenge is understanding and knowing your supply chain deeply. 
something uh, I think uh, speaks to the credibility that Mark just mentioned. Um, we've been working in clean energy since 2009 or so, for, first for our own facilities, for our data centers, a tough technical challenge, and then we move to our supply chain. Um, you know, to be 2030 carbon neutral for Apple means our entire supply chain has to have net zero emissions. And we intend to do that with 75% of those reductions coming through conversion of dirty energy to clean energy. So agree that there are times we need removal. Uh, we're using nature-based removal. Agree that's an incredibly important uh, investment for the planet right now but we're also very focused on that transition. We've already helped 70 of our suppliers make the transition. By 2030, we have to move our entire supply chain. Uh, that means we have to understand the energy they use, measure it, monitor it, and then help them along the transition, which interestingly enough is not always about money because clean energy is actually cheaper and can be a great investment for these companies. It's about the know-how which investments make sense, which ones will actually lead to uh, the kinds of clean energy that can offset or replace the emissions they would otherwise uh, have. Once all of the supplier projects we already have are completed, we're talking about over 14.3 million metric tons of CO2 coming off um, of our carbon footprint. It's like taking 3 million cars off the road. And then we still have more to do. Uh, so we're very much uh, invested in that through our green bonds, through our U.S.-China Green Fund, which will invest $100 million in accelerated energy projects over the next years um, with our energy efficiency programs, our water efficiency programs. But basically, it means the kind of work with our supply chains and with our customers, because we also look at the energy that hopefully you use as a customer when you charge your device. So it means deep work along with governments and utilities around the world in order to really hasten the transition that we need for our business and hopefully that ripples out um, around, around the world to our customers and the communities where they live and work. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I love how all of these interventions have just been so relentlessly practical and ambitious at the same time. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce Christiana Figueres, who uh, needs no introduction in this room. Um, Christiana is most recently the founding partner of Global Optimism, and she was, of course, the executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and led the global negotiations that culminated in the Paris Agreement that is our touch point uh, on all things climate related. Christiana, you have spent a lot of time thinking about pathways and momentum. And in the lead up to COP26, as we think about the year ahead, what, what in your view is the most important thing that the private and public sectors need to do together to put the world on an irreversible path to net zero? Oh, well, thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me to join this conversation and wonderful to see so many friends here together. Um, well, the one thing that everyone needs to do is to work together and not to assume that the responsibility can be exported either from the corporate sector to government sector or the other way around. Uh, now, admittedly, the geopolitics right now is not helping us, at least on in one country, but we see that there is incredible leadership, even at the government level, on in some other countries, and Elizabeth has already uh, talked about the um, very remarkable uh, announcement from President Xi Jinping yesterday. But generally, I want to say that I am so, uh, so delighted to see that 2020 that was at the beginning of the year slated to be recognized by history as the great pause, that now by the second half of the year, uh, I'm hoping that we have changed that in the history books, eventual history books, to go from the great pause to the great reset, because that is what is already happening. And I would like to um, put two pillars under that great reset. The first is the extraordinary power of publicly stated ambition. All the companies here uh, on, on screen and that will be in the conversation have publicly stated their ambition. 
And what they are actually doing is they're proving the Paris Agreement wrong. And I am delighted that they're proving the Paris Agreement wrong because their goals of decarbonization and carbon neutrality are actually pushing the envelope and showing that it, decarbonization by 2050 is not only possible, it's actually maybe even late because we can get to decarbonize economy before. So the fact that we have uh, companies that are setting their decarbonized or net zero goals by 2030, by 2040, some by 2035 is absolutely fantastic because it shows that once you publicly state your ambition, having done your homework internally, of course, what you do is you unleash innovation and you find that as a corporation, you increase efficiency of all kinds of resources, not just energy. And, and as Lisa has pointed out just right now, you also take advantage of your impact up and down the value chain, up and down, uh, certainly up the supply chain and down into your customers so that you bring them along in this transformation, thereby making that um, transformation deeper and, uh, and quicker. And so, so that as a, as a first, um, observation that I'm seeing of the power of stated bold ambition. The second piece that um, I am observing is that we are seeing this decarbonization occur not just in and of itself and not just for climate purposes, not just for the efficiency of carbon in all of our operations, but rather it is bringing along in a very integrated nature, a true resetting of, uh, of corporations and of their relationship to civil society, to citizens, and certainly to governments. What I mean by that is that we're beginning to see the movement away from Milton Friedman's doctrine of uh, shareholder primacy over now, especially this year, to stakeholder um, stakeholder capitalism. And it's been you know, spoken to uh, by Professor Schwab for such a long time. But this year, we're really beginning to see evidence of that, of so many companies truly understanding that BP recently being no small example of that. The other piece that we're beginning to see in integrated in this decarbonization is a shift of mindset from quarterly thinking and planning to quarter century thinking and planning. So from short termism to long termism, something that frankly, five years ago, we thought was going to be incredibly difficult to uh, to dig ourselves out from, but that we are really beginning to see. The same thing we're beginning to see this year, especially um, with a huge lesson that we're deriving from COVID that yes, the first stage of COVID was to lock ourselves into our homes and offices, but the second stage of coming out demands radical collaboration in order to get to the vaccine at the scale and the speed that we need. So we are beginning to see the movement and, and that's going to be a sticky lesson to many other um, areas beyond health, which is the movement from silo acting to radical collaboration across many boundaries. The same thing for the movement from exclusive uh, decision-making and especially um, staffing and hiring to inclusive hiring, staffing, products, services that are beginning to be much more inclusive in, in a, to a large extent fueled by the wisdom that we have derived from the very painful racist tragedies that we have experienced this year. And two more, uh, from extractive to regenerative, I'm beginning to hear so much more of a commitment to regenerative corporations that begin to see that not only are they going to be um, climate neutral, but actually climate positive, and yes, for really leading the charge on this, truly moving from extractive to regenerative to understand our capacity and our responsibility to return the resilience to nature that we have actually extracted from her over the past 50 years and make sure that we're no longer pulling at that um, at that rubber band to the point where it will break uh, and, uh, in, and be unable to return to its resilience, but rather 
uh, beyond extra beyond taking pressure away to actually intentionally regenerate the resilience back into nature, back into the economic system, so that we have that play uh, play area for uh, for future impacts. Um, and finally, of course, the incredible role um, that we are seeing in digitalization and AI in moving us from linear progress to exponential. That frankly is, I think, what is going to allow us to get to 2030 um, and, and be able to uh, witness the halving of emissions. Because if we do that linearly, we won't get there. But because of the corporate leadership that we have and because of the injection of digitalization and AI into so much of corporate decisions and operations, um, I do believe that this exponential transformation, this hockey stick um, that we've been talking about will actually get us to that, uh, the, the top of that mountain, which seems pretty challenging right now, um, but that we're getting more and more confident that we will be able to meet. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I love um, the idea of radical collaboration that you you spoke about um, just earlier this week. The Secretary General of the UN had a line that said, solidarity is self-interest. And this is clearly a time when when that is profoundly, profoundly true. Um, our final speaker is Lord Martin Callanan who is the United Kingdom's Parliamentary Undersecretary of State and Minister for Climate Change and Corporate Responsibility. Lord Callanan, we're thrilled that you can join us. As COP26 president, you have, together with the UNFCCC, launched the Race to Zero campaign to mobilize businesses, cities, regions, and investors for net zero emissions. And all of our eyes are obviously focused on Glasgow with just over a year left. Can you tell us about your vision for COP26? What are you going to count as success and what do you need, especially from the private sector to be able to get there? Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you to the World Economic Forum for inviting me to be part of your panel uh, today. Um, on your question about the UK's vision for, for COP26, uh, firstly, we need to make progress on the Paris Agreement uh, objectives build charter pathway to well below two degrees and aim for one and a half degrees. Uh, secondly, we need all countries to come forward with uh, 2030 climate plans which include increased transmission on their industries. And thirdly, we need countries to deliver on their climate finance. Uh, you know. As for our Hello, role, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think some of our um, audience is having a hard time hearing you. So if there's a way to get a little bit closer to your microphone, that would be wonderful. Okay, sorry, is that better? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, much, much, thank you. Apologize for interrupting. Sorry, not at all. Um, as for our role in the presidency, we will provide uh, direction to maintain momentum in the multilateral process. We will bring parties together to deliver on all of the legal mandates and to reach a negotiated outcome that uh, accelerates climate action and finalizes the Paris uh, rulebook. Uh, we will use the power of a fair and an inclusive presidency to bring government, business and civil society together to accelerate progress in five key areas. Adaptation and resilience, uh, ensuring that communities and countries can adapt to the worst effects of climate change by stepping up access to funding and expertise for resilience and adaptation on nature by protecting and restoring natural habitats and ecosystems by working with countries and communities to preserve the planet's biodiversity, soak up emissions and improve, of course, our health and well-being. Accelerating the transition to a clean energy future, encouraging countries, businesses and communities to seize the opportunity provided by the rapidly falling costs of renewals, renewables, innovation and energy storage. Cleaning up the air we breathe by speeding up the global transition to zero emission vehicles, phasing out petrol and diesel engines in all forms of road transport. And of course, bringing it all together, finance. Accelerating the green transformation of the financial system so that all countries have access to the funds to drive clean and resilient investment. We will create a safe, secure, sustainable and inclusive COP26 summit that sets the conditions for outstanding policy outcomes 
and leaves a lasting legacy of change here in the UK. We will use the our COP26 presidency, our G7 presidency, to champion a clean, inclusive and resilient global recovery and put climate change front and centre of the post-COVID debate. Now, moving on to the role of the private sector in these uh, plans. Uh, there's no question that business action remains crucially important to achieving a successful summit and a successful presidency. And I would particularly like to thank all of the companies on the panel with me today who have already outlined their own bold steps to create a net zero future. And my key request to other businesses here today is that we continue to make these bold decisions. I encourage your companies, those within your value and supply chains, to join the race to net zero. This initiative launched by the high level champions for COP25 and COP26 is the largest ever alliance of businesses and non-state actors committed to reach net zero by 2050 at the latest. Almost 1,000 businesses, 38 investors, almost 500 cities and regions have already joined the race to zero, representing 53% of global GDP, $72 trillion in annual revenue and 23% of global emissions. Many companies around the world are already stepping up to join them in the race to zero by setting a science-based net zero target through initiatives such as the business ambition for one and a half degrees C or the climate pledge. We are at a critical moment for the world's climate. To keep global temperature rises to manageable levels, we have to halve emissions over the next decade. And it will be companies like yours that will make all of this possible. So thank you again for inviting me on the panel today. And I look forward to working with many of you in the run-up to COP26 in Glasgow next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Callanan, and thank you all. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come in through Slido um, and we will do our best to get to as many as we can. What I'm going to suggest is that I, I pose a few questions at once and then you can take them as you have an inclination and some will obviously speak more to one person than another. But let me, let me hit on a few themes that have come through, through the chat. The first is about citizens and how citizens can put positive pressure on governments and companies to change. You obviously, all of you from public, public to private sector are already leading this sort of change, but where do you see the most important levers for citizens and the actions they can take to push to, to give you the encouragement and encourage others to follow your lead? A second question is about tracking progress. And a number of you have spoken to the ways that you're tracking progress, but given how important it is to measure and track progress, to do that in alignment, as we've heard um, already, how do you best track progress? How do you think others need to join in, in similar ways so that we really can see cumulatively where we are uh, on the curve? Um, third question is about COVID recovery. Um, it's in all of our minds, I think, that the recovery from the last financial crisis led to a wave of investment in renewable energy and electric vehicles. We are about to get hit with an incredible um, infusion of new capital into the global economy in the context of COVID recovery. It's a huge opportunity if well spent. It's actually a, a terrible risk if misspent in the co climate context. So how do you think about that challenge and what uh, would you most want uh, to put on our uh, on everybody's agenda. And last, everybody uh, in the chat room is interested in your perspectives on the China announcement, if you care to share something about that as well. So I'm gonna open the floor to you all um, and see who might like to go first. And if no one steps up, I'll start calling on folks. Um, Elizabeth, right. I'm happy to take, I'm happy to take the um, question of citizens and I, what I take the relationship between the individual and the systemic changes, if you'd like. Perfect. That's okay. great. Um, so I, I think that the question poses or puts its finger right in a very, very important point, which is, of course, we need to see systemic changes because the scale and the speed of the change that we need can only uh, be done if we also have systemic changes. But is there a role for the individual to help to spur those changes, absolutely. And in my mind, I don't actually see this as an individual versus systemic. I see it actually as a running the gamut, as a spectrum that goes all the way from the individual behavior and individual decisions to the systemic. And let me say what I mean by that. 
all of us individuals can make a difference on climate by the choices that we make on how we eat, what we eat, how we transport ourselves, how we dress, where our savings are, and certainly how we vote, just to give you a small list of things that, uh, that we can all do. And by, by doing that as individuals, collectively, obviously not one individual, but if there are enough of us around the world taking those decisions in the right direction toward net zero, then collectively we send very, very strong market signals to those companies, especially consumer facing companies, because we send the signals that say, we want the products and services that are actually decarbonizing or decarbonized. That is what we want. And therefore, demand can determine supply. Demand from customers, from citizens, from clients can determine what companies are doing because the companies and many of the companies here on this conversation are actually anticipating a much higher expectation of responsibility down the line than they are getting right now. And we are walking that path. So the combination between what, system, what individuals we do as individuals and what corporates and governments can do systemically is actually very, very linked. Um, and my, my final word to that is that we, shouldn't, we should remember always that those that are at the top of the power, CEOs or heads of state or governors of, uh, of states or, or um, mayors of cities, they are also individuals and they take decisions. And in as much as they as individuals and as single people understand what their responsibility is, they will align the um, the space that is under their influence, the jurisdiction over which they have uh, they have responsibility. My best example there is the number of CEOs that I have spoken to, some on this call, but many uh, outside of this call who tell me, I'm doing this because of my children, because my children ask me when I come home, what are you doing for my future? Are you stealing my future or are you building my future? And that goes all, all the way, the gamut from CEOs, from renewable energy companies, all the way to oil and gas and everything in between. So let us not think of individuals and corporate and government as completely siloed from each other, but rather as extensions of the same line of progress that we can move forward. Wonderful, thank you, Christiana. Um, I think Jesper, you just volunteered to take on the question about COVID recovery. We are, I fear, running short on time. So if I can ask everybody to make their interventions um, economical and then uh, Jesper, over to you. Uh, thank you. I, I, I must say, I, I agree to what uh, Christiana says also. I think people can vote with the wallet and that's going to be so important. And to the citizen part, I think it's also so important that we don't leave people behind because then the whole change will backfire. But to the COVID, I, it's just a, a personal reflection. I think, uh, I, I believe um, the calamities of COVID has made, made us more human and it's made us stop, reflect, um, and I think uh, has driven uh, quality into decisions into this process. But I also think there is an opportunity now, uh, looking from a pure financial perspective, um, the year we're in, I assume for most businesses, is going to be a strange year in the PNL, um, anyways. So it's a fantastic year, I think, to take uh, uh, courageous decisions and to make uh, proposals for uh, long-term investments. So I, I, I would strongly encourage everyone on this call to reflect on what are the decisions that could fit into this year uh, and not postpone it to the next year. I stop there. Thank you so much. Um, Mark, do you have thoughts? Turn to you. I think you're on mute, Mark. Here we go. Sorry about that. So just wanted to echo very much what Christiana and uh, Jesper said. I think it's about voting with your wallet. And uh, that also means at times being prepared to spend a bit more for uh, a product that meets all the criteria and uh, to be a discerning consumer and to consume consciously. I think this is what it's all about. On the recovery, whether it's companies or uh, countries, I think there's a great temptation to go for the short-term fixes. And I think this is where we all have to act with restraint 
and look towards the things that really give us uh, longer term uh, recovery in line with the uh, uh, ecological targets and ambitions. Uh, I mean, just think about politics. I mean, the quickest way to spend money is to pave a road, okay? But uh, that's not helping anyone in this situation. And so spending it thoughtfully and spending it in ways that's really in line with those uh, 2050 ambitions is going to be hard. Um, but we got to do it and we got to have that discipline and we got to uh, meet or exceed um, the uh, yardstick from 2008, 2009, when you think about some of the recovery spending at the time, it's got to be higher on the ecological scale now uh, than it was then uh, to really have some impact. And last thought on the uh, metrics, um, we will need some harmonization, but what we shouldn't do now is talk 10 years about um, what exactly that one single uh, standard is going to be. So I think we will need to be democratic here about allowing a few that get us there and uh, and uh, have some tolerance here, but uh, clearly some harmonization is gonna be needed. Fantastic. Um, Lisa, can I turn to you? Thanks. Uh, so much has been said uh, by my dear friend, Christiana. I'm gonna leave most of it there. I, I just wanna mention um, tracking. I think it's incredibly important to track tons and gigatons, obviously. I think it's also incredibly important to uh, include people in that equation in terms of equity to ensure that the programs that we're looking at are also bringing more equity, you know, greater equity and justice to a situation than less. The last thing I'll say is it's incredibly important when looking at things like offsets to ensure that we're looking for high quality offsets because the price of offsets should go up because the supply of high quality offsets is limited. And if the price of offsets is higher, that means we're forced to go back and invest in clean energy and other mitigation attempts. So we can't game the system and no one on this call uh, is doing that. But I think it's incredibly important if business is gonna be in the lead in some countries, my own where right now the federal government is not in the lead we have to be rigorous about the accounting we use so that we don't game the system, so that we're making actual positive change um, and not, you know, not cosmetic changes, frankly. That was a very strong through line here about credibility, seriousness, and the quality of interventions and actions, which is obviously so paramount. Um, Lord Callanan, do you want to have the last round at the questions? Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, there's a number of very good points already been made, which uh, which I won't uh, repeat. But if I can take, talk from the point of view of the of the United Kingdom, certainly in the run up to COP26, uh, we're, you know, we're going to try to involve as many citizens uh, as, as possible. We're going to be running campaigns to highlight um, what the UK government is doing, our leadership, uh, and try to bring the whole nation into the into the conversation on building back uh, better. So in response to our to, to COVID, um, you know, we've launched a couple of um, very large stimulus schemes. Um, Chancellor's investing about three billion pounds in, as my Prime Minister said, building back uh, better, building back uh, greener, and we're investing that in uh, in something called the Green Homes Grant, which uh, which provides um, grants to to citizens uh, in the country to install energy saving measures, uh, heat pumps, insulate their homes, uh, etc. So you know we're, we're we're generating jobs, we're 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 providing a boost to the economy, but we're doing it in a in a green and, and sustainable manner to help to contribute to our climate change goals. Thank you very thank you very much. Um, I we are almost out of time, so I just want to ask each of you. I mean, this has been a wonderful conversation already. Um, if I can ask each of you just to offer to our, uh, our audience what the one word is that you would have chosen or that you chose this morning when we did that initial World Cloud poll about what climate ambition means to you. Um, can I start? Uh, maybe, Lord Callanan, I'll start with you. Just one word. Action. 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 Um, if I'm talking about it, we need to do something. Action. All right. Lisa. Justice. Awesome. Christiana. Determination. Fantastic. Um, Mark. I'm in the action camp too. <laughs> and Jesper. Opportunity. And Professor Schwab, since you're still on the line, I'm going to ask you too. What's your one word? Pa uh, partnerships. Partnerships. 
Excellent. Well, I can't thank you all enough for such an incredible conversation. We could be here so much uh, longer and have so much meat to get into. I really just want to thank all of our esteemed panelists, thank the forum, thank the audience. Um, this is not only a rich discussion, it's clearly an urgent one. And in various ways, you have not only all spoken about this continuum of change, to use Christiana's phrase, but you live it every day. And we uh, appreciate that and are grateful for it. It's incredibly encouraging to see some of the world's leading companies taking this to heart in such a powerful way to put us on the trajectory that I know we need to be on. So thank you all again for joining today. Um, for those of you who have joined from Top Link, if you want to continue the conversation, please join us in the speakers lounge right after this. And on your screen, you should also see several upcoming Sustainable Development Impact Summit sessions that might also be of interest to you, and I invite you to join those too. Thank you all once again, and uh, onward.